You are watching programming from the East West Center in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon from Washington, D.C., and welcome to the East West Center in Washington's seminar today, uh, Indo Pacific Security Seminar, with Dr. David Shambaugh of George Washington University. We're delighted to have you. Um, for those of, uh, of you who I've not had a chance to say, uh, uh, happy 2021. Uh, this is our first program of 2021, and it's an absolute pleasure and honor uh, to welcome the very eminent scholar, former practitioner at the Department of State and National Security Council, uh, member of the National Committee on US-China Relations, term member of Council on Foreign Relations, and an award-winning scholar, uh, Dr. David Shambaugh, for his latest book, uh, where great powers meet America and China in Southeast Asia. Now, many of you will know that David is, uh, is just one of the premier foremost authorities on China. And over the last few years, he's been delving into Southeast Asia and spent considerable time there and traveled there, which he'll, he'll, he'll explain. And he has a new terrific book uh, that I've been dipping in and out of to understand better how this competition and what particularly attracted me about this book, I must say, is that there have been, you know, recently at least four, maybe more, books dealing with what China is doing in Southeast Asia. What I think David has done really quite magnificently is put the China story in context and calibration with the story of the US role in the region. And as a result, he's come out with some findings uh, that allow us to better think through uh, the emerging uh, competition and, or, or relationship between U.S. and China, but also how Southeast Asia plays into the U.S.-China relationship. So with that, the goal of this program is to let David explain his book for about 25-30 minutes, then I'll raise a couple of questions and comments for him, and then we'll open it up to public uh, Q&A uh, using the chat function. So welcome all of you, and especially David, thank you so much for taking your time, uh, your busy schedule to do this program. Please, over to you. Thank you very much, Satu. I really uh, appreciate um, your kind introduction and the invitation of the East-West Center uh, here in Washington to host uh, today's session. Um, greetings from Washington. Uh, those of you who are not in Washington, you may see some snow flurries begin to come down in the course of the next hour. We have snow predicted here for DC. So those of you out in Honolulu or elsewhere, you can feel lucky or unlucky depending on your preferences. Um, but I just wanna begin by thanking you and, um, and Richard Volstek out in Honolulu, who I think is on the call today too on uh, for all the really great work you do with the East West Center year in and year out, decade in and decade out, dates back to 1960. And I honestly think it's just the poster child for American soft power and public diplomacy uh, in the region. In fact, I discuss it in the book, um, uh, in the soft power section of the book, um, but really, you just contributions uh, with the East West Center uh, in the region, in Honolulu, and certainly here in Washington. So, uh, job well done. Keep it up. <laughs> I just want to start with that uh, quite, quite sincerely. Page, you contribute page a great deal too. Well, you you contribute uh, the United States uh, in the region. And one of the points I'm going to make this afternoon is the importance of public diplomacy. Uh, in American uh, regional diplomacy across the Indo-Pacific and how I believe uh, we really need to step up our game. And that that's actually one of the weaknesses of the United States in the region. Um, I'll get to this when I discuss the book. I have a kind of balance sheet, you might say, of strengths and weaknesses of both China and the United States in the region. Um, so I'll, I'll come back to that. But the East-West Center, um, if we could just replicate it, you know, times 100, uh, it would be great. So um, let me try and do uh, three things, I guess, in, uh, in terms of introducing the book, because we want to have as much time for conversation between the two of us and then Q&A with people uh, who are out there watching today. Um, so what I'd like to do first is give you a little context about 
um, the background of the book, how I got into it, then offer a few of the main conclusions and takeaways uh, for the book. People are interested in sort of bottom line things. Um, and then speculate uh, at the end a little bit about the future and offer some possibilities for alternative future trajectories of the US-China competition in uh, Southeast Asia. But hopefully this will maybe incentivize our viewers to afterwards go out and, and uh, maybe purchase a copy. You know, Christmas has passed, but Valentine's Day is just <laughs> around the corner, makes a great, great gift for your loved ones. Uh, in all, all seriousness, I should say too, that the book was released uh, here in the United States just prior to Christmas. Uh, early mid December, um, but it's not won't be released globally until February first. Um, doesn't mean you can't order it, um, but it will be in the proverbial shops and regional distribution chains uh, from February one all over the world. Okay, so um, so how did I get into this? I mean, it's I have to say I've worked uh, on Chinese foreign relations for most of my career in different parts of, of the world, US, China, China, Europe, and China, Asia. Um, but I have to say that Southeast Asia was really kind of terra incognita to me before I ban began this project. It still is. <laughs> I mean, one of the first things you learn is the extraordinary diversity and complexity of the region. And the deeper you dig, you know, the more complex and diverse it becomes and the more one realizes they don't understand about the region. So I'm very much a kind of newcomer, I would say, um, to Southeast Asian studies, but uh, at the same time, I'm absolutely addicted. It's gonna be part of my intellectual focus uh, for the rest of my career. Uh, and I sort of wish I'd gotten uh, into the region earlier. Of course, I've been through the region. Uh, Singapore a number of times, Vietnam a couple of times, Thailand, Burma back in the 19, late 70s. But I hadn't really traveled to a number of these other, other countries. So that's the first sort of caveat. I'm not a Southeast Asia specialist, but maybe in the making. And I was really fortunate to be the beneficiary of um, invitations uh, from, first of all, the Roger Ottenham School at Nanyang uh, Technological University in Singapore, who invited me during a sabbatical in 2017 out there. So I spent uh, eight months uh, there, um, based there, I should say, and, and teaching there. Abs I can't say enough good things about RSIS. Absolutely fabulous people, great institution, great leadership, and really has built the best IR program in the entire region in my personal view. So, and then I went back the following year to, um, the Institute for Southeast Asian Studies, um, uh, Yusuf Ishak Institute in Singapore, different host institution that time, but I hadn't quite figured out, finished up rather the um, field work in Malaysia and Indonesia, um, particularly related to the Belt and Road. So I went back in 2018 for a summer uh, to, to do that. ISIS, again, I, our viewers don't need to be told about ISIS. It's the world's premier institution on Southeast Asia. Uh, full stop. Uh, again, great people, great hosts, and I'm very appreciative to both of them. The third institution I'm appreciative to is the U.S. Department of State, who um, um, facilitated, well, who uh, invited me to be on their international speakers program, which is run out of the public diplomacy, uh, cultural affairs side of the State Department, international, all around the region. I gave you know something like 40 lectures in eight months in nine countries uh, plus India. Um, and that was really helpful to the research, but it really helped open my eyes and, and it put me in touch with audiences and people um, in different walks of life that I wouldn't have necessarily otherwise met during the course of the research. So um, many thanks to um, uh, the US State Department too. So those were the three kind of catalysts for the research. Um, now, second uh, contextual thing to say is that this is not uh, just a book about China, as you just indicated, Satu. Um, it's very much a book about the United States and China uh, in the region. Um, and as you just said, there are several really excellent books about China and Southeast Asia that have just come out in the last three months. Um, our colleague Murray Hebert here at CSIS in Washington, uh, Sebastian Strangio, um, 
who's based in the region. Uh, my colleague, our colleague, Mike Lampton, and his, co his two colleagues, Lena Ho and Chongqi Kwik in Malaysia, produced a great book about uh, high-speed rail. And Don Emerson at uh, Stanford has come out with a book. So there's this sort of miniature tsunami of publications, book publications about uh, China and Southeast Asia, very welcome, I, I should say, from a teaching perspective and assigning, there's now a literature. The last things on the region were published back in 1960s and 70s. You know, it was really hard from a, a teaching perspective to find uh, really good up-to-date uh, literature to assign to students. Anyway, we have, so mine adds to that a little bit on the China side, but as you say, this is a book about both powers. And that's the next uh, contextual factor. This is um, a book about competition um, between the US and China. And I believe that uh, that is the major defining characteristic of international relations uh, in our era today. And at least as far as my eye can see into the future. It's what I call indefinite comprehensive competition. It exists across all functional domains political systems, diplomacy, commerce, security, military, espionage, ideology, values, technology, education, research, public diplomacy, soft power, culture, media, governance practices, both internal and global, and so on. And it, it, this competition exists in every region of the world, and indeed in the Arctic and the Antarctic and in outer space and in cyberspace, you know, it is really full spectrum competition. So that is, that's an assumption. I just want to get my cards on the table. That's an assumption I personally hold about uh, not just the US-China relationship, but uh, international relations. And so what I've done is to take that independent variable, if you will, and then apply it to Southeast Asia um, as a region. Um, and see how this competition is playing out in that region. Um, because I think it could offer, um, the Southeast Asia case could offer, uh, well, it's kind of a microcosm for these, uh, these various dimensions of the US-China competition that I just mentioned. Not all regions of the world mirror Southeast Asia exactly, no. Some other, you know, Latin America has its dimensions that Southeast Asia doesn't have. But there's a lot of commonalities across space, geographical space, I would argue, across the world. And looking at the Southeast Asia cases is really illustrative, and it may be a harbinger of things to come in other regions of the world. So that's a, another context, contextual factor. And um, then the last one is that this book is not just about contemporary affairs. It's not a snapshot of today. I just want to forewarn readers, if you're going to go out and buy the book for your loved one for Valentine's Day, they're going to get a book that's very much about history, too. Um, you know, you can't parachute into any region and understand the dynamics of it. That's, um, you know, just sort of obvious. But boy, when it comes to uh, Asia, it comes to Southeast Asia and anything concerning China, one really has to have a sense of the uh, historical dynamics over time. But I would argue too that it applies to the United States. Obviously the United States has a much shorter history in Southeast Asia than does China, but um, it dates back to the first American consul who was sent to what was then called the Dutch East Indies, today Indonesia, in 1802. And then I proceed through in a, in a rather lengthy chapter through the America becoming a Pacific and Imperial, and in the case of the Philippines, of course, a colonial power at the turn of the century um, following the Spanish-American War. And then I trace the or sort of expanded American commercial and naval footprint in the region uh, between the wars in the early 20th century. Then I go, of course, through the Second World War um, on both mainland Southeast Asia and maritime Southeast Asia. And then I walk through the Cold War, including the American War in Vietnam. So that chapter, historians would cringe, you know, that the political scientist is trying to, you know, compress all of those things into a single chapter. Um, but I just felt that readers needed to have that background before they dive into the present. And so I have a parallel chapter on China, <laughs> even longer, from the Qin Dynasty, you know, 221 to 206 BC, 
through really to the 20th century. And that goes through a lot of interactions between the, from, from when we first have recorded records of interactions. And it's interesting, you know, Wang Gungwu, who, to whom the book is dedicated, and I have enormous respect, he notes that records of China Southeast Asia interactions are entirely on the Chinese side. Um, Southeast Asians didn't keep records <laughs> for very various reasons. The Chinese are great record keepers. They've always kept records, <clears throat> one of their attributes. <clears throat> So the first records of interactions go back to the, <clears throat> between the Han and what were then called the Ye people or the, and the Dai people down to in modern day Yunnan. Um, there were so many Yes, basically anybody who lived south of the Yangtze or certainly south of Guangxi were called Ye. They were called the Bai Ye, hundred, the hundred Yes. <laughs> so, so the Chinese kind of encapsulated, uh, you know, people, Vietnamese, Laotians, hill tribes, Thais, so on and so forth. So there's, it starts off with that. Then it goes through quite necessarily the Nanyang, Nanhai trade, maritime trade, and the tribute, so-called tribute system about which Wang Gungwu is really the world's authority. Um, but that's the first real interactions between maritime Southeast Asians and China. The, uh, continental interaction between China, Southeast Asia, of course, uh, in the case of Vietnam, adjacent to, contiguous to, and occupied and by and subjugated by China from 111 BC to 938 AD, <laughs> basically a century. That's not a pretty history. There's obviously tensions, longstanding, still existing tensions between the Vietnamese and the Chinese that are historically rooted. Um, so, and then I talk a little bit about the Chinese relations with the Champa and um, other continental Southeast Asians. So, and then it moves into the 20th century. Well, it goes through the Ming Dynasty, goes through the Zhenghe voyages, which is an important part of the story. Then moves into the into the um, early 20th century, where Southeast Asia becomes a base for exiled revolutionaries to plot the overthrow of the Qing dynasty, the Manchu Qing dynasty. And Sun Yat-sen himself, as we know, he traveled a lot, uh, Europe, America, Hawaii, but spent a lot of time in Singapore and then up in Penang in Malaysia where they established really the, um, the nationalists established their uh, overseas um, base, you might say, for plotting that revolution that, took, that finally occurred in, in 1911. Then that chapter walks through China Southeast Asia relations between the wars, uh, essentially a colonial story, um, and then into the PRC. And that is a story essentially of subversion, I would argue, under the Maoist period of China trying to undermine, usurp, overthrow, subvert Southeast, multiple Southeast Asian states through the export of revolution, through the support of communist insurgencies in every single one Southeast Asian state. So when the Chinese argue that they never interfere in the internal affairs of other countries, I would remind them to go back and look at their own history of the 1960s and 70s in that part of the world where they very much uh, did interfere and were very subversive. But like everything else in China, Deng Xiaoping comes to power in 1978, change. Dung cut off all those insurgencies, with the exception of the Burmese Communist Party, interestingly, there that kind of straggled along for four or five more years. Um, but it, from then on, and then that's the end of that chapter, and then I get into more contemporary affairs. So the point is that if people are looking for just today, parachute into the current, yes, that's in the book too, four chapters, but you're going to get a lot of history. So that's the background of the book. What are my main you know, sort of takeaways. Um, so the first takeaway, uh, it's, it may seem rather obvious, but South, Southeast Asia is really uh, intrinsically important in its own right. It is not just, and I don't mean to argue in this book at all, the title may suggest that, um, you know, I'm just looking at a region of the world in which the great powers are um, waging their competition, you know, the Indian fable, when the elephants fight, the grass is trampled. Um, that metaphor may apply, but um, this is, Southeast Asia is no Petri dish, you know, it is no, it's, 
it may be the region in which one region in which this competition is playing out. But I make a I would really emphasize the point that the stakes are high. This is a very dynamic, very sprawling region, covers 1.7 million square miles, 3,000 miles from east to west, 2,000 miles from north to south, is um, has 636 million people, 11 nation states, of which 10 are members of ASEAN, Timor-Leste not yet. Um, vital strategic importance for anybody who looks at the map with the you know Straits of Malacca Isthmus and then up through well and Sunda Straits but up through the South China Sea um, through which pass annually 50,000 vessels 40 percent of the world's merchandise trade 25 percent of the world's uh, energy supplies oil and LNG I mean, it's just hugely strategically important in energy terms and and trade commercial trade terms. Other terms, the region is characterized by diversity with a capital D across everything, culture, religion, political systems, uh, e economic systems, even you name it, um, which, you know, is leads to an important point, very difficult, if not impossible and definitely dangerous to try and generalize about Southeast Asia. We do that. We talk about Southeast Asia all the time. This is a session on Southeast Asia, but you know, every one of those 11 countries has their own um, characteristics that shape its interaction, their interactions with each other, right? And one reason ASEAN is, is you know, for those who think ASEAN is weak, uh, diversity is a source of weakness. But I'm actually of the view that ASEAN is not as weak as it is dismissed, dismissively seen to be by some here in Washington. I think there's a considerable record of accomplishment that they don't get credit for over their uh, years, decades of existence. We can come back to that. But diversity, and then just in economic terms, this is the world's, has been the world's fastest growing region in the world since the financial crisis of 2008, 2009. It is the sixth largest economy on aggregate, if you add those uh, 11 economies or 10 ASEAN economies together, with a nominal aggregate GDP of almost $3 trillion in 2018. That's not pocket change. So first big takeaway, view Southeast Asia on its own terms. And that will lead me to one of the conclusions. Whichever of these two powers, and, and as they pursue their competition with the other, the one that views Southeast Asia in its own terms is going to do better in the competition. Do not be reductionist and see the, see the region or the 10 member states you know, as objects. Um, take them seriously, understand the intrinsic dynamics of each, get your fingernails dirty, get down into the context of each country and tailor your policies accordingly, right? One size does definitely not fit all. So, um, so that's the first takeaway, kind of self-evident certainly to specialists on the region. Um, second takeaway is that I characterize the competition between the US and China as a soft rivalry. Now, what's he mean by that? Well, it's distinct from a hard rivalry. Okay, what's the distinction there? Well, I um, argue that during the Cold War, um, which is of course the kind of reference point for the US-China rivalry, what's similar, what's different from Cold, Cold War 1.0? Are we in 2.0? And if so, what are the similarities? What are the differences? And it's very important for analysts, not to mention practitioners, actually understand the, not just the differences, but the similarities. And I can discuss those too. But anyway, I just, in the Cold War 1.0, uh, that was a, a tit for tat, action reaction kind of rivalry. Washington did A, Moscow did B. Washington would do C to counter Moscow's B. Moscow would do D to counter Washington's A. It was a real interactive dynamic all over the world, European theater, Asian theater, uh, Middle East, er elsewhere. So if you look at the US-China competition in Southeast Asia today, I do not see that action reaction, tit for tat. Both of these powers, are present, boy, and they are maneuvering. Um, and they kind of look over their shoulder at the other, but they are not premising uh, their, their policies and their activities based just on what the other is doing. They're each, especially the Chinese, I think, are just 
uh, you know, pursuing their various interests. Those are primarily commercial interests. And I, so I have a kind of metaphor in that chapter. This is like shadow boxing. These two powers are kind of boxing around each other, but not landing blows and coming into direct competition. Now, from Southeast Asia's perspective, that's a good thing. That's where the ASEAN states want to keep the competition. They do not want to be in the pincers and the crosshairs of action, reaction, tit for tat um, behavior between Beijing and Washington. And we hear from Li Xianlong, Prime Minister in Singapore, and many other regional leaders, don't make us choose, right? That's the standard but very genuine um, feeling in the region. So soft rivalry. So far, it could change, and I get to my scenarios in a second, it could become much more reactive and uh, polarized. But it's a fluid kind of competition. And it's multi-dimensional. And it really depends on the dimension you look at to see which one of these two powers is stronger or weaker or doing better than the other. It was a very complicated chessboard. You know, you're talking not just about the US and China, but and 10 ASEAN states. But then that brings me to my third takeaway. This is not just a dyadic story about the US and China. They're not the only actors in this drama. Regional so-called middle powers have very important roles to play. Japan. India, Australia, the EU. Uh, until this past year, 2020, the EU was ASEAN's leading trading partner. China has eclipsed that in 2020, but certainly on a commercial front, um, the EU is very present. C uh, cultural exchanges, very present. Dating, you know, there's a lot of colonial ties. More Southeast Asian students go to European universities than come to American universities universities. There are 54,000 come to the United States last two, two academic years ago. Um, but there are something like 65, 70,000 that go to different European universities, UK and, and others. So, you know, there are long, there's, the EU is a big uh, cultural player, economic, commercial player, and in the five power defense pact, even a security player. Um, so these middle powers and South Korea, too, has now launched, in fact, I was in the audience in Singapore uh, summer of 2018 when President Moon came down and launched his so-called southward policy. Um, so I was there to, to hear that. And they've been trying, the South Koreans, trying to uh, put some uh, teeth in that. Uh, so this is a complicated chessboard. You know, you've got these regional middle powers. And again, from Southeast Asia's standpoint, good news. That's exactly what Southeast Asia Asia wants because it helps dilute the uh, superpower uh, pressures. Okay, so the more actors in the region, the better from Southeast Asia's standpoint. And also that has implications for both Beijing and Washington. If you can work, if the United States can work better with these other regional powers, it's a multiplier effect. I was discussing this with Michael Green uh, the other day. So uh, the, that's an advantage for the United States. All, all those countries I just named, Japan, India, Australia, Europe, um, South Korea, are American allies, right, and good partners. China can't claim that. So I would argue one of the strengths in America's toolbox are exactly these other powers. So the more, that's a multiplier for the U.S. That's a third takeaway. Last takeaway, um, kind of couple with, with, buried within this, the counterintuitive conclusions. I found um, one kind of overarching counterintuitive conclusion, and I label it that China is what I call an overestimated power, and the United States is an underappreciated power. Okay, so what does that mean? Um, well, when you travel around the region, as, as you have and many of our viewers today do, one is just struck on a daily basis by this pervasive region-wide, almost hegemonic narrative about China. China, China, China. China's the dominant power. This is the natural state of affairs. You know, Asia's returning to, you know, maybe a 21st century version of the tribute system. Uh, and it's important and that this is China's regional sphere of influence and everybody needs to just understand that and get on the train get on Beijing's train. That you encounter, uh, I was just struck by it, going country to country, reading regional media. Um, well, I argue in the book that this is overstated 
um, empirically, this narrative. And uh, in fact, if you talk with Southeast Asians in different countries about China, you get a range of views spectrum, but I uh, found a lot of anxiety, a lot of ambivalence, a lot of suspicion about China. Um, that China is just too big and too present. You know, when you talk to Southeast Asians, the first thing they'll do is sort of point upwards in the air because China's up there. And the image that they have is that it's just uh, like a thundercloud over and it won't go away. Just geography is a big factor for both countries and for the United States, just the opposite problem for the United States. But um, the pervasive ambivalence uh, and anxieties about China plays out in polling. So just look at the IC Institute for Southeast Asian Studies annual surveys. I think we're due for another one very shortly this month. Maybe it's even come out and I've missed it. Usually it comes out in January. But the last two years, um, the suspicions of China are are borne out uh, in those and other surveys. So don't, and there's sort there are various reasons we can go into this in the discussion about why Southeast Asians have suspicions about China. But I would include um, BRI as one of those sources. Now, don't get me wrong. I think most Southeast Asian countries actually welcome BRI. But in the last few years, Malaysia, Indonesia, Myanmar, Cambodia, uh, even Vietnam, have all uh, begun to push back against China, and they've they've enc they've encountered different problems with the Chinese uh, in the BRI projects. We can go into that if you're interested. So I see. China actually overreaching, overstepping, and alienating a number of Southeast Asian states. Just the opposite of this narrative meme that you've encountered in the media. Now, we all know perceptions are important. Perceptions become realities. But I was just struck going out there and doing the research that this perception about China and the inevitability of China turning the region into a sphere of influence is not, in fact, empirically correct. So that's one counterintuitive conclusion. The last counterintuitive conclusion pertains to the United States, underappreciated power. Well, um, and I, come, I found this not just as an American, but um, Southeast Asians have little sense of the breadth and depth of the American presence in the region. What they should do is read the annual publication that the East-West Center and the U.S. ASEAN Business Council published together. That's what's called, I forget the title, it's America Abroad. ASEAN Matters for America. That's AS ASEAN Matters for, there it is. That is a one-stop shop on what the United States does in Southeast Asia. Every Southeast Asian ought to read it. They would be surprised, if not shocked, at the breadth and depth of the American presence in the region. Uh, security assistance programs, bar none. China comes nowhere near the American security assistance programs. And I'm not just talking about arms sales, I'm talking about training um, <clears throat> and uh, joint exercises and a lot, of, a lot of things that the US is doing with not all, not Myanmar, not really Laos and Cambodia has been suspended br briefly recently. But the US security assistance footprint, huge. The Asia Pacific Security Center in Honolulu, just down the street from the East West Center, very important organization, the kind of Marshall Center of Asia. Soft power and cultural, American cultural power, still very attractive in the region, despite the fact that the last four years have um, really dealt the United States successive numerous blows on the soft power front for reasons I think we're all familiar with. America's reputation has been badly damaged. That's also borne out in the ICES polls. Um, but there's a, there's a reservoir, residue of, of American soft power attraction across the region um, that will, I think, now uh, hopefully return um, more fully. And then economic presence, uh, just to finish up, I mean, the U.S. economic presence is not paltry. We have $355 billion of trade with the region in 2018. Um, doesn't match China's 500 billion in 2018, it's now up to 600 billion, but $350 billion in trade is not insignificant. Investment, this will surprise people. The US does 25.9 billion in investment in 2018, China 12.9. So twice as much American investment than China in the year 2018 into the region. My favorite statistic is if you look at the cumulative stock 
Um, there's no comparison. $329 billion of American uh, cumulative investment in Southeast Asia. That is greater than uh, Japan, China, and South Korea combined. So as I say, that's a sort of headline, you know, takeaway. But the point is that you, and if you look at American companies, there are 4,200, 4,200 U.S. companies operating across the region. So the U.S. commercial footprint, not insignificant. Um, okay, so those are the takeaways. I can elaborate on any of those if you like. So let me just get to the last uh, last element. And Sarah, if you could please put up a slide. Let's look to peer into the future about four possible um, uh, scenarios. So I posit in the last chapter, four scenarios, further bandwagoning with China, continued soft rivalry, which, which has created a situation of what I call competitive coexistence. That's the present. We are in soft rivalry and competitive coexistence. Uh, third alternative scenario would be a harder rivalry and greater polarization of the region um, with more intensified US-China competition. And then the fourth option is what I call a more neutral hedging, where the Southeast Asians really assert their agency, keep the two big powers, I don't want to say at bay, but dilute them in various ways, including with middle powers. So those are the four scenarios I, I foresee. Now, this slide that I've put up um, is an in indication of, of the first, of bandwagoning. And it's my sense, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a snapshot, you know, of 2020, where I see these 10 countries kind of on, you know, a spectrum between the US and China. Seven of the 10 are on the Chinese side of the neutral line. Philippines, Singapore, Vietnam, I place on the other side, the, despite Duterte. Um, the depth of U.S.-Philippines relations still dwarfs the China-Philippines relationship. So these are, this is a kind of composite um, snapshot, as I say. It's fluid. That readers and viewers need to see this as fluid. A year before I put this slide together, I had a similar spectrum in an article, and the countries lined up slightly differently. And a year from now, they may line up slightly differently. This is a very dynamic uh, situation. And they all move back and forth across that spectrum. And their sweet spot is in the middle, <laughs> is in neutral, but probably leaning towards Beijing. There's, there's going to be some significant degree of bandwagoning. Uh, that's a fact of life. And it, for a number of reasons, I do not foresee any kind of bandwagoning back with the United States. Those days are over. So for the U.S., what does this mean? Let me just close here. Um, it means that the U.S. needs, especially with a new administration now in office, the U.S. needs to stay steady, be present, invest in all the tools of power, diplomacy, military, commerce, culture, public diplomacy. We've really got a major public diplomacy uh, challenge cut out for us. Um, we have some great uh, PD officers in our embassies. I met them all. They hosted me. We've got some great people here in Washington in the State Department, in EAP and in public diplomacy, some really dedicated people. We need resources, uh, which the Trump administration gutted. But we need more than resources. We need narratives. We have to tell our own story better, and we have to counter China's narratives. So part of PD is countering falsehoods. And so there's that element too. Anyway, um, the US has got to really invest in all the tools of power and simply be there for Southeast Asians and provide them an option to China. Because when China becomes too omnipresent, too overbearing, too proximate, too manipulative, and too interventionist, all of which I see them doing, or early signs, they are going to want alternatives, not just the Americans, but as I say, Japan, Australia, India, EU, others. So uh, that's the landscape in Southeast Asia. And we'll see, you know, if each of these powers, um, how they play their hands. ASEAN is not without its own agency. I have a whole, the last chapter, the most lengthy chapter is all about ASEAN's agency. Um, so why don't I leave it there, Satu, and hopefully we've stimulated, uh, you know, some food for thought out there. And um, we can have a conversation and then happy to take questions. And Sarah, you can take down the slide. Thanks. 
Wonderful. Uh, David, thanks so much. That was a uh, true de force uh, and um, very clear and uh, compelling. Um, we do have questions in the chat, but as I said, we will uh, begin with a couple of things. I, I, I wanted to frame a, one question about the US uh, as I was uh, dipping into your book, one about China um, and one about Southeast Asia, because I think you're right. We've discussed this before in other contexts you know, we really have to remember Southeast Asia has a lot of maneuverability, navigating room. They, they're experienced at moving and jockeying and there's a lot of dynamics going on that they have domestic politics. We forget sometimes they don't wake up in the morning and think, oh, US-China strategy, what am I gonna do today? They, they're working domestic issues, et cetera. So it's great. Let me, about the US. We have all kinds of debates here, apropos new administration. We've discussed a maritime, predominant approach versus a mainland Southeast Asia approach. Uh, we've sometimes discussed we need a Southeast Asia strategy that's separate from a China strategy or a US Asia strategy. We've discussed coalitions. What we really need is to get our biggest partners. And as you say, the diversity of Southeast Asia makes such a policy approach quite complicated to define and to develop. And um, in your, based on all your field work, your interviews, your speeches around, so the first question I have for you really is, what works best for us? Because in the book, you talk about being an offshore balancer. And that suggests a very particularistic coalition of players, <clears throat> which doesn't quite correlate with the dynamic spectrum along the lines of leaning towards the US because you, you have some mainland countries on the spectrum, you have some maritime. So I'd like maybe just for you to think about that. That's one question. The second is really structural, but precipitated by events in the last 26, 24, 20, 36 hours. China surpassed the US in FDI, in, in incoming FDI this past year, according to Untown. And its GDP growth rates are the only major economy that grew during the pandemic. However, one wants to take exact figures, and, but, but overall, the economy seems to be coming back. The US announced in the last 15, 16 hours, by American, a worker middle-class approach towards economic policy, equity, trade agreements. What are the implications for this central idea of your book that you've articulated, which is, People think that China is going to be the weight or gravity in the region. And the evidence of regional integration suggests that that's the case, but they're very worried about it. So that's the China question, you know. Mm -hmm. And just Southeast well, mostly, Asia, uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I think you've posed two, two good questions. I just have to remember the first one while I try and address the second. Sure. Um, you know, I, as has been evident in some of my previous writings, including my uh, China Goes Global book, which was titled, subtitled The Partial Power, I've been a, a long, not a long time, but over the last seven, eight, nine years, I've become a China skeptic hmm. um, and I, in general. And I found in Southeast Asia this overblown narrative. Hmm. Um, so I just think it's, worthwhile that we caution ourselves when we read numbers like that, you know, and, and we hear about the China juggernaut and, uh, you know, the PLA fielding 350 battleships and, you know, this and that, whatever, you know, data point of the day is on the China capability side. Um, I'm not dismissing them, they're real. And the Chinese economy uh, is very real and Southeast Asians know how real it is. You know, we can have our discussions here in the United States about managed decoupling or some decoupling. Um, Southeast Asians, I'm not sure they can, they can't have a discussion about decoupling. They right. can't decouple even if they wanted to decouple. Right. Frankly, I think a lot of them would like to diversify, mm -hmm. not decouple. That's where these other powers come in, the EU and Japan in particular, but also India. In, um, so when I mentioned those middle powers uh, don't just think strategically think in, in economic terms think cultural terms think diplomacy mm -hmm. um, 
So, you know, uh, yeah, I had, hadn't heard those latest UNCTAD figures. Now, China's got a lot of uh, empirical attributes, um, I would say. But attributes, as Joseph and I will tell you, do not automatically translate into influence or into power. Mm. Um, you have to convert capabilities towards specific ends. That is the definition of power. Mm. Power as defined by as influence. Now, just because they've got, you know, X GDP and Y number battleships and they put a, a lunar rover on the backside of the moon or whatever, um, I wouldn't just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little skeptical. And I like to caution people. Uh, plus, you know, I've spent enough time in the last four decades in China to know about their domestic weaknesses. I repeat, mm. domestic weaknesses. Mm. <laughs> we could go, that's a subject for a different seminar. Mm. Um, they do a very good job of masking their domestic weaknesses and presenting this juggernaut uh, perception to the world and she, under Xi Jinping in particular. But you have to scratch the surface, not very far and dig down. One finds all kinds of, of um, vulnerabilities, weaknesses, problems. You know, what country doesn't have them? I'm just saying China has them. So I'm just trying to, on your second point, I think we're all well served, including Southeast Asians. Just take a deep breath uh, and, you know, don't get sucked in by all the empirical indicators. Uh, your first question, if I can remember it, um, had to do with, you know. What's the best approach for us? Is it, is it offshore? You say offshore balancing in the book, but that connotes a certain kind of coalition of right. allies, partners. So based on your research, what will work in Southeast Asia? Can we really do that without destroying the overall approach to Southeast Asia as Southeast Asia or? Right, else? well, I honestly think, you know, you, when you asked the question, you posed three or four alternatives. And my quick response was so to all of the above. Hmm. of which offshore balancing was one of the four I think you posed. Um, that's more on the security side and the geostrategic side. But we've got to do a, a lot of things simultaneously and we have to tailor our toolbox to each of the countries. What works in Thailand doesn't work in Vietnam. Hmm. What works in Vietnam doesn't work in Indonesia. What works hmm. in Indonesia doesn't work you know, in the Philippines necessarily. Hmm. So really the first requirement of American diplomacy is to understand all 10 of these countries on their own merits mm. and then uh, work backwards with the toolbox. Now I'm very concerned, uh, well, I should say, say about a couple of the countries, namely the Philippines and Thailand, but let me just add to my presentation about, I didn't really talk about American weaknesses, I meant to, so greatest weakness, geography, tyranny of distance. We're, you know, it's, it's a 28 hour, or sorry, 18 hour flight out there. It seems like 28, you know, then you <laughs> go to multiple countries and stay in the region for four or five days. It's not like getting on a plane to Tokyo or Beijing and flying back when, after you do 24 hours of, of business. Um, so that's been, that's just a fact of life um, for American diplomats. And it has led to, uh, episodic diplomacy at the best. One of our greatest weaknesses, I hate to say it, is we, and all Southeast Asians tell us repeatedly, you must show up, come physically. Your president has to come, your vice president has to come, your secretary of state has to come multiple times per year, mm. right? Not once, not twice, four or five times. Show up, come to the multilateral meetings. Your secretary of commerce needs to come. Your treasury secretary needs to come. Your defense secretary needs to come. Now our, our, um, our service men, particularly and women in white in the Navy, they show up all the time. If we could just match on the civilian side what Indo-PACOM does in the region, where they have a very good presence, uh, we'd be a lot better off. So we've got to get in the diplomacy game. We've got to get in the public diplomacy game, as I have emphasized. And there, those are separately. So we have to show up and um, buy that. Okay. You can't go to all 10 countries each time the Secretary of State flies out there. But, you know, if you pace it, you can hit all 10 in six months. Now, I'm really worried about Thailand 
Actually, I'm only worried about Thailand. I'm not worried about the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Once Duterte is out of power, the mm -hmm. Philippines, in my view, is going to swing back to its traditional close relationship with the United States. Those ties are very deep. Duterte mm -hmm. is the exception to the rule. He's a complete anomaly. And his pivot to Beijing hasn't gone so well. He doesn't have a whole lot to show for it. So, yeah, I'm a little concerned about him. You know, he canceled the visiting forces agreement. And he does, you know, you wake up every day and you want to wonder what's he going to do next. It's like Trump. Um, but basically, that's a strong relationship. Thailand, uh -uh. Mm -hmm. I'm really, I'd be interested in our viewers and your own views, so-called ally, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not really, as Catherine Del Pino and others will quickly tell you, it's not really an alliance. It's based on the Rusk Tanak communique, you know, and a couple of fuzzy statements. Uh, it's not an alliance the way Americans think. And but and Thailand has you saw they have swung very close to Beijing. I was told in my research that forty percent of core had some in China, not by China, not joint exercises in China. Now, what does that mean? I don't know. Maybe just going to the National Defense University in Beijing for a two-week course, which is mm -hmm. what I think it means. But there's a munitions factory the PLA has now built in Thailand, first one outside of China anywhere in the world. Mm. They're starting to produce. They've sold some submarines to the Thais. They've sold some other ships and planes. Thailand is a very important state. It's a wing state in this U.S.-China competition. And the United States better focus like a lake on Thailand. The other, uh, and we'll, I'll start with this, but we are focused on but I don't think that the Vietnam-U.S. relationship really is deep uh, and as predictable as many here in Washington think it is. <laughs> and, that's, you know, that's based on my interviews in the book about that. You know, I, uh, the Vietnamese are really slow walking the U.S.-Vietnam defense. They allow one ship visit a year. So what do we do? We send in an aircraft carrier. Good. <laughs> But there, there's a lot of stuff. The Pentagon has had a whole menu of defense cooperations. This is, it's like Vietnam. The Vietnamese are going, uh-uh, no thank you, not right now. And they're slow walking other things. And they have a very close relation, much closer relationship with China than we, uh, we know about. Beginning with the party to party relations between the Vietnamese and the Chinese parties, investment, a lot of stuff. So the Vietnam relationship, I think, has been missold here inside the Beltway. Mm -hmm. And we need to, you know, we can't assume it. We have to kind of educate ourselves on what's driving the Vietnamese in their approach. So we have to apply that to all 10 countries because, you know, every one of these 10 countries has motivations. So just to answer your question, the greater we and the persons and the motivation agency in the domestic policy said in each of the 10, the better off the United States is going to be. In mm -hmm. other words, don't come up with some one size fit all strategy you know, and try and implement it across the region. You have to tailor it. Well, great. Uh, Dave, thank, thank you so much for those comments uh, on my questions, but I do want to get to the Q&A section of our program and we do have some minutes for that. I'm going to just use prerogative to kind of bunch up a couple of things as I see them to the best of my ability. So just so that I can maximize the number of questions I can take. So folks, please bear with me. Uh, so we have a couple of questions from Ambassador Piper Campbell and others really about the Trump administration uh, um, decision to declassify the Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, does it have the potential to handcuff the, the new administration? And on the same issue of the new administration transitioning uh, from the Trump administration, another question is uh, how, should, how should this administration approach uh, because it also comes into a third question about how do you balance human rights with our security leverage in the region? And in the, in the Q&A question, it's specifically about Myanmar, but it's applicable across. A lot of anxiety, as you know, Bob Sutter and I wrote a report recently called uh, The Hardening U.S.-China Competition and Regional Responses. And in it, one of the concerns that Southeast Asia expressed was, we anticipate that the Biden administration would emphasize more human rights, democracy, um, climate change issues. So there'll be greater asks, mm -hmm. but the US-China competition will, will, con will continue. So we'll be asked to do more on that front. 
and you see the Marine Corps strategy in this context, et cetera. So how do we balance this? This is all about the new administration. A lot, a lot in there. And I thank Piper for her question. I don't know Piper, we've never met, but um, I thank you for your service in the Foreign Service for all these years, Piper, and as our ambassador to ASEAN. I visited uh, our um, embassy to ASEAN, as it were, um, in Jakarta just, just before you arrived, actually. Um, so thank you for your question. Uh, the first part of it about the declassification of the Indo-Pacific strategy, does that handcuff the, the Biden administration? I don't think so at all. Um, I must say, I read the declassified version and I thought, you know, why was this classified? <laughs> that was my first reaction. You know, my, some of my students um, and their colleagues, you know, this is pretty sensible stuff. Um, they put it paper they needed to do, you know, in order to give guide, so-called guidance to the embassies and the various parts of our government and military. But, you know, I didn't, there's no great surprises in that document to me. And um, I think the Biden administration is perfectly content with that document and will simply build upon it. And in general, I think the Biden administration, as Tony Blinken said in his uh, confirmation hearings, basically sees the Trump approach towards China as correct with some tactical differences. That's a distinction Blinken made in his testimony. I would fully agree with that. I think we all recognize that. Working with not just allies, other countries is what you know he might call tactical differences. Well, it's pretty fundamental, certainly across the Atlantic with the, our EU allies and partners, but the same applies across the Pacific and the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and the neglect, you know, you can't beat up countries over trade on one hand and then try and ask them for something the next day. So, um, so yeah, the Trump administration made some error, tactical errors uh, in the region, including not showing up. You know, Pompeo showed up once in the last each year, or the last two years in the region. I'm not even sure he showed up in 2020 in, in Southeast Asia. He did the previous year, but anyway, that's far from enough. Um, so yeah, I would be critical of the Trump administration on the implementation of their strategy. But frankly, um, I thought it was a pretty sensible, sensible not surprising uh, strategies. It needs to be built out and the Biden team will do that in the national security strategy. And I'm sure there'll be some certainly classified but unclassified um, elements of that for the region, but I think it doesn't hand, tie the hands of the Biden administration at all. That'd be my quick reaction to it. Um, I'm sorry, what was the rest of Piper? The, the, the Myanmar balancing human rights, rights versus our security. How would you uh, see that going forward across the region, not just Myanmar? Right. Well, um, human rights is going to assume a more central place <laughs> Uh, in the Biden foreign policy. It couldn't assume any less of a central place than the Trump administration's policy where it, where it hardly, hardly factored in at all. It certainly didn't with the president. I'm not, I'm not saying the Trump administration uh, didn't uh, push human rights issues, but they did. Uyghurs, Xinjiang, okay? Tibetans, Mongolians, inner Mongolians I'm talking about, Rohingya. Um, and in, Eastern Europe and across Eurasia. So, you know, actually when I think about it, the Trump administration was not um, AWOL on human rights. Uh, they just weren't heard enough. And the Biden approach, um, to me, the first burner issue, you know, and there's something that is a global, um, whether it can be classified as a genocide, I'm not an international lawyer, but it's obviously something the United States needs to be out front on, uh, working in partnership with many other countries and in the United Nations uh, to resolve this uh, humanitarian um, condition. Um, human rights issues in other, well, there are more in Burma besides the Rohingya. So Burma is an issue defer to people, you know, David Steinberg, Derek Mitchell, others who understand the Myanmar situation more detail than I do. Um, when I look across the rest of Southeast Asia on a human rights basis. I don't see any major red lights blinking that, uh, you know, are going to substantially complicate our, 
other our bilateral relations with other countries. Duterte's drug war, yeah, uh, that's a problem. <laughs> How many people, I just read the newspaper, 14 people killed yesterday in a drug yeah. raid in somewhere in the Philippines. Is that a human rights issue? You know, that, I'll leave that again up to the experts. So human rights will be brought into Biden diplomacy on a global basis. Um, what's your name? Shanti Talafil is the human rights coordinator on the NSC. She comes out of a very good background of the National Endowment for Democracy. She's really competent and capable across the Indo-Pacific. So yes, I would imagine that's going to play a greater role in American global diplomacy. The degree it does in Southeast Asia to be determined. Let me, let me turn, David, to a question from um, a colleague in the Philippines, Renato De Castro, who's been a uh, East West Center visiting fellow and is, is going to be coming again when conditions allow. But he uh, somewhat pushes back on your issue or your kind of net assessment of, of soft power competition. He sees the South China Sea as a place where the US and China are already locked in kind of an action reaction uh, response. Would you tend to agree with that? Well, I don't see the South China Sea as a soft power issue. I see it as a hard power issue, mm -hmm. number one. And there he is correct that there is a hard power action reaction dynamic ongoing there, by which I, of course, mean the American FANOPS, uh, Freedom Navigation Operations, um, around the seven uh, manufactured Chinese islands that are being progressively militarized. They're not fully militarized yet. Um, in fact, there's not a lot of permanent emplacements of equipment and troops on those islands yet, to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. I don't study the satellite photos on a daily basis, but they're ro certainly rotating uh, ships, planes, material, and people through them. And they are building out their, uh, they, the Chinese uh, military footprint uh, in the Spratlys. They already have a pretty good one up in the Paracels. And the United States is enforcing um, freedom of navigation. We do not recognize, as the International Tribunal in The Hague ruled unanimously, the nine dash line is null and void, full stop, no question. To the rest of the world, <laughs> it is a, um, it's not shared by the Chinese. Uh, and the Southeast Asians, of course, have their own contested claims, it's, depending if you count Indonesia as one of them, six um, contestants. So that's a hot, that's a front burner security issue. It's not a soft power issue. Mm -hmm. um, I was surprised though, in my research in the region, how relatively little this came up. Now this is gonna, this is another one of my counterintuitive takeaways. Now, maybe I'm wrong, but here inside the Beltway in Washington DC, if you talk about Ch China and Southeast Asia, or US China, Southeast Asia, South China Sea, South China Sea, South China Sea, that's all people talk about. Well, you go out to the region, it may come up, it's like a fifth issue or a sixth issue. There are other things that are going on with respect to China that concern Southeast Asians. That doesn't mean that they're not concerned about the claims and the militarization, but they have a sense of fait accompli. What can we do about it? And the answer is they can't do much about it. That's when they turn to the United States. They want the American FONOPS. They want the American military footprint. They want the US engaged. So um, this is gonna be with us you know, indefinitely, this sort of cat and mouse. I don't know if it's tit for tat, but certainly kind of cat and mouse back and forth over the, Spr over the Spratleys. Um, and it, it's dangerous. Top order of business, in the US-China relationship, if I were advising the Biden administration, negotiate and deepen the uh, rules of engagement in, in the air and at sea. Now we have, with the Chinese, we have two, in, two MOUs that were negotiated uh, recent in the outgoing Obama administration, but there's not a lot of teeth to them. You know, we could have an accident be our planes and our ships any day of the week. And that could escalate quickly because there are no conflict escalation mechanisms as we had in the Cold War with the Soviet Union. So when I talk about taking, you know, I'm, I'm a believer in what I call managed competition, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not just for competition, I'm for managing it, for bounding it, for building in guardrails, 
buffering it so it does not bleed into a full conflict. And you have to start there with um, military um, crisis escalation control mechanisms, lots of them. Um, that is really a first order of business because an accident in the South China Sea or elsewhere in Taiwan Strait or even in the East China Sea and elsewhere could quickly escalate militarily. Um, so I would say if I was advising the Biden administration, get to work on that straight away. Let me take one last question, David, and, and impose upon your time and those of people who can still join us because we're running a little bit over, but I think it is a very interesting question that comes from our president, Richard Volstek, actually, which is about the business behavior of Americans and Chinese in the region and how you found that to be perceived because we hear all kinds of story about Chinese labor coming into BRI projects. We hear about gambling, we hear about corruption. So how do these commercial ties beyond the beyond the attributes, as you said, data and, and right. how, how do people perceive them in Southeast Asia? Who's, whose business people do they more want there? Well, great question, Richard, uh, and greetings to you, your longtime friend um, of many years. And I can see your, your question comes out of your AmCham background. Um, and I would uh, ask this question throughout the region in my research. I sort of throw a softball question to my interlocutors about Chinese doing business and Americans doing business and just see how they would react. And it sort of went fishing. And very interesting things come back. And usually the first thing that comes back is, has to do with corruption. Corruption on the Chinese side and lack of corruption on the American side. I can't tell you how many Southeast Asians said, David, you Americans, the best thing you have is the um, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. <laughs> you are clean. Your businesses here are clean. You are uh, obeying not only our laws, you're obeying your own laws. You're not uh, bribing. You know, you're, it's a really, and I'm not sure people appreciate the importance of that um, for the United States and for other countries have similar kinds of laws. So that's a reputational thing. That's a soft power issue. It's not just a, a commercial issue. It's really good for American reputation. China, corruption is the first thing that would come back. You know, I had one Malaysian tell me, I did a lot of research in this book about the BRI projects in Malaysia. I went to 11 of the 13 of them or something. And uh, one interview I did, they said, well, here in Malaysia, we cost our BRI projects in thirds, one third rake off for the central government, one third rake off for the locality where the project is, and one third for the actual cost of the project, right? Well, I'm not sure what that says about Malaysian corruption, vulnerability to corruption. That's also a, a statement, but it also shows how the Chinese will do business. BRI or otherwise. You see that in Africa as well. I don't want to paint a really broad brush, but yeah, that is a characteristic of Chinese business. Um, the other thing you've come across, Richard, is the, uh, the hard infrastructure versus soft commerce, soft facilitation. So the Chinese are building things, right? Ports, rails, buildings, roads, hard, hard stuff, which is needed. Um, by all means, uh, all these countries need that hard infrastructure. One can question sometimes, and some of them are about the types of the infrastructure. And here I, you know, you can read Mike Lampton's book on high-speed rail, but do these countries need high-speed rail? They need water treatment plants. They need electricity grids. They need a lot of stuff. You know, does Laos need a high-speed rail system? I don't think so. Does Cambodia need a higher speed rail system? I don't think so. Indonesians I've interviewed, including very high in the government, told me that the Bandung Jakarta high speed rail link was basically forced down their throat by China. You need a high speed rail link from Jakarta to Bandung. Oh, not really. We need a few other things in Sumatra and Kalimantan and this and that. But, you know, can we kind of put the and then the Indonesians said, you know, we want competitive bidding with the Japanese, long story short. So the Chinese BRI hard infrastructure, first of all, there's an appropriateness of the infrastructure. They're building this massive port at Malacca Gateway that's supposed to be three to four times the size of Singapore's port up there in Malacca. Well, you know, 
what are you going to do with four times the amount of container traffic coming in there that comes into Singapore? How are you going to get it distributed into rail lines? You know, so a lot of these BRI projects I'm skeptical about because the Southeast Asians themselves are skeptical about. We've seen this in Sri Lanka. We're seeing that other other places too. And that doesn't say anything about debt diplomacy and other dimensions and labor you mentioned. So there are 30,000 Chinese laborers in Indonesia doing BRI projects. Well, that's really got the Indonesians upset and for good reason, you know, it's a replay of what goes has been going on in Africa for a number of years. Chinese will fly everybody in, build the project, fly out without a lot of participation and buy-in from local countries. So that kind of stuff is what's feeding the anxieties that I picked up on, you know, in the region. I don't maybe want to overstate them. They can't get out of the box. You know, they are in China's commercial box, but they want greater say, they want greater agency themselves vis-a-vis -vis China in these projects, and they want uh, Japan in particular. They want the ADB, they want the EU, they want the United States, they even want India and Australia. They want others to, in the region commercially, Richard, to dilute, I think is the phrase, um, China's presence. And what I meant by facilitative, so the Americans aren't building things. Bechtel has come back after a long absence. Americans are facilitating things. If you look, and Richard has, at the Chamber of Commerce, American AmCham memberships and the US ASEAN Business Council memberships, these are countries that are in the facilitative space. You know, they're consulting firms, they're law firms, they're um, e-commerce firms, they're um, banks, certainly credit cards, other you know, they're not, we're not, we're out of the infrastructure business, but that doesn't mean that we're out of uh, the facilitative, you might say, commercial space. Well, David, thank you so much. I suspect we could go on for much longer about your fascinating book, and I'm going to hold it again, up again. Now, I do not know about other viewers, so I do not speak to them or for them, but I'm not sure this will fly as a Valentine's Day gift, but I urge you to get it as a gift nonetheless, maybe not label it as a Valentine's Day gift. But, um, but it's terrific book, uh, a, a, as you can see from David's presentation, uh, he writes fluently and uh, interestingly about the subject. It really takes on both the US and China, and it really is uh, particularly um, uh, important, I think, because it presents a calibrated picture of the scene rather than the relentless um, juggernaut of China, but rather a kind of nuanced view of the competition and pays a lot of attention to Southeast Asia as well. So I urge you to get that. David, we'll wait for your next book. But in the meantime, all of those who joined our program, uh, we will be doing uh, additional programs as we go through 2021. We've been systematically thinking as the transition in the administration occurs and new things roll out, how to frame our program for um, relevant topics, but stay tuned. We'll have more to announce. We have some very interesting lineups of books and themes coming forward. And David, we will wait for your next book to invite you back, but thank you so much for doing this today and thank everyone for joining us and good evening to you or good day to you wherever you are. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Satu, and everybody else. Have a good Thank day. Bye-bye.